My name is Jamon McKinney, or you can just call me Juice because that is my nickname. Welcome everyone to the Juice Alert episode number 46 for you ladies and gentlemen today. If you have not subscribed to the Juice Alert already, be sure to do that right about now. You will not regret it. You can of course find me on YouTube as well as podcasting platforms. That includes Spotify, Apple Podcasts, Google Podcasts, all that great stuff. If you're listening to this show on YouTube, be sure to smash that like button right about now. It definitely helps me out. And also, if you're feeling kind, be sure to leave me a good rating and review on podcasting platforms. If you are listening to this show via podcasting platforms, like I said, my feedback and these likes and things like that, these reviews, they definitely help me out right here on the show. Today, we have a great show lined up for you guys today. We're covering 18 NFL topics today. I'm going to officially reveal my rankings for the top five quarterbacks in the 2021 NFL Draft. I will also reveal my first round 2021 NFL Mock Draft. I'll talk about Aaron Rodgers, the Patriots, the Lions, the Eagles, three teams that could very well maybe be drafting quarterbacks in the upcoming draft. We'll talk about those teams. A lot of things to talk about today. Before I do get started, I just wanted to say you guys can follow me Jamon McKinney on social media. My Instagram is G H I M A N underscore M C K I N N E Y. And my Twitter account is at G H I M A N M C K I N N E Y. And if you want to get specific updates regarding this show, you can follow the Instagram and Twitter account for the show. The Instagram account is the Juice Alert underscore, and the Twitter account is at the Juice Alert. I want to open the show by talking about an organization that I truly, truly do admire in the National Football League. That organization is the Kansas City Chiefs. So the Kansas City Chiefs just recently acquired offensive tackle Orlando Brown from the Baltimore Ravens. They gave up a bunch of picks to acquire him. It pretty much solidifies their offensive line. Mitchell Schwartz, you know, did walk away from the NFL this past offseason. We saw Kansas City's offensive line struggle in the postseason. We all know how bad they looked versus the Tampa Bay Buccaneers defense in the Super Bowl. That was a big reason why Kansas City ultimately lost that game. And now they totally retooled this offensive line. They've acquired Orlando Brown. They bring in Joe Tooney. And they've really shirt up what which what they really shirt up what was their biggest weakness and biggest concern heading into this upcoming season. And now Kansas City, they're locked and loaded and ready to go on potentially another Super Bowl run. We'll see what Baltimore does with those draft picks. I don't really have too much of a take on what Baltimore acquired, but all I got to say is I truly admire aggressive teams in the National Football League because aggressive teams, those are the teams that are winning. You know, Tampa Bay, they went all in this past year to acquire Tom Brady. They went all in to get the players they needed. They won a Super Bowl in Tom Brady's first season in Tampa Bay, you know, and we see in other sports, you know, other teams that are super aggressive. They're winning immediately. Kevin Durant goes to the Golden State Warriors. The Warriors are aggressive. They win a title immediately. Mookie Betts to the Los Angeles Dodgers. They win a title immediately. And I just truly admire that the Kansas City Chiefs, they're all about going for it. They're all about trying to absolutely do the best they can to put the best players on the field so they can win a Super Bowl right here, right now, and they'll figure out the draft picks and the salary cap later on, okay? Who cares about the draft picks that Kansas City, you know, has? Most of the players that they're going to be drafting are good enough to start on their roster. And because they're making deep playoff runs, deep playoff runs with Patrick Mahomes, you're not going to get the best player picking at number 25 overall, 30 overall. It just doesn't work that way, you know? Most of the best players are the top 15. And obviously you can, you know, draft, you know, certain players later, later in the draft that could become steals. But the point I'm trying to make is, Draft picks in the NFL, to a certain degree, are overrated. Sure, you want to home grow your players, but you need star-level, Pro Bowl-level players to win Super Bowls, proven commodities. And that's the route Kansas City is going in. And listen, Kansas City obviously has Patrick Mahomes. They've got Andy Reid. I give Pat, I say Patrick Mahomes is an A-plus quarterback right now. I say Andy Reid is an A at head coach. And I would consider the Kansas City Chiefs organization to be an a to an A-plus organization as well. Anytime you can get the quarterback, the head coach, and your organization to be an A to an A-plus, 
You're going to be in the Super Bowl conversation every single year, and that there's there's a reason why teams like you know Green Bay you know, haven't won a Super Bowl in over a decade because they don't make enough for agency moves. And it's really sickening to see an all-time great quarterback in Patrick Mahomes, you know, get all this support and a guy like Aaron Rodgers, you know, not get any support in Green Bay. I mean, Kansas City was asking, okay, Patrick Mahomes, who they wanted to draft in this past, who he wanted them to draft in this past draft. And he said, give me Clyde Edwards a layer. They gave him Clyde Edwards Lair. Aaron Rodgers, he goes to the NFC Championship game. Clearly the team has holes. They draft a quarterback to replace him potentially for the future. And Aaron Rodgers has to elevate the roster from within rather than Green Bay actually going out and spending money to help him, you know. And a couple of years ago, the Kansas City Chiefs were a good football team with Alex Smith on their roster. They were good. They were winning 10 to 11 to 12 games a year. But they realized there was a ceiling with Alex Smith. And they took a flyer on Patrick Mahomes, a guy that was very that, that a lot of scouts were critical of at Texas Tech, but they developed him, they groomed him properly, they moved on from Alex Smith, and what do you know, Kansas City, they might be the favorites to win the Super Bowl for the next, you know, three to four seasons just because Patrick Mahomes is that great. Andy Reid's a great coach that to me has enough has another at least half decade of good coaching left in him. And Brett Veach and the Kansas City Chiefs organization, they're an A to an A-plus organization as well. Like I said, anytime you can get the quarterback, the head coach, and the jer- and the and the front office right, you're in good business. Kansas City, they're definitely in the Super Bowl pitcher. And sure, they have good players, but a big reason why is because the organization doesn't hold on to coaches way too long. They draft well. They acquire talent through trades. And they're never satisfied with just being good enough. Let's be great. Let's not just be good enough. Let's be great. Let's be the favorites. Let's dominate. I love the way Kansas City operates because they're an aggressive team and they very well could be rewarded for it by potentially winning a Super Bowl within the next couple of years if they, you know, can cash in in the playoffs. But we'll see. But I do admire Kansas City, no doubt. I want to talk about Trevor Lawrence, the quarterback out of Clemson that is entering the 2021 NFL Draft. A lot of people believe that Trevor Lawrence is the best quarterback in this draft class. And a lot of people, including myself, believe he is a generational talent, okay? I've said in the past Trevor Lawrence is awesome. I've said he's worthy of the number one overall pick. And a big reason why is because his floor is incredibly high along with his ceiling. Meaning, if Trevor Lawrence, for whatever reason, doesn't become a top five to a top 10 quarterback like he projects to become based off of his talent, I still believe Trevor Lawrence is going to be a well above average starting quarterback that can win you a lot of games and potentially a Super Bowl if things break right. I don't I don't really see too many scenarios where Trevor Lawrence could become a bust. Sure, if he doesn't get the right head coach, sure, if the organization never supports him, Jacksonville does have a lot to prove as an organization. But bottom line, Trevor Lawrence is amazing. But what if Trevor Lawrence were to become a bust? What if he were to fail? What potentially could be the reason? That's what I'm going to talk about today. You know, Trevor Lawrence played at Clemson, okay? At Clemson, a, a college and a football program that right now is probably the best football program in America outside of Alabama. When you're at Clemson, you get the best coaching staff, you get A plus facilities, you get great protection, you get star wide receivers, you get you get great running backs, you get a great defense. And like I said, Clemson, they're the second best college football program outside of Alabama. Trevor Lawrence played in 40 games in three years at Clemson. And he only lost two of those games. I'm willing to bet my money that by week number four of this upcoming season, Jacksonville is probably going to have at least two losses, okay? They're a rebuilding team, and Trevor Lawrence is going to have to overcome some things in Jacksonville, you know? And he's inheriting a team that only won one game this past year. So he's going from from a top-flight level college program to an organization that has been dysfunctional for the past decade for the most part. At least they've proven to be that. but. I really don't have that big of a concern in that regard when it comes to Trevor Lawrence. I understand the reality of playing in Jacksonville is you're going to have a bad offensive line, a bad defense, and a rookie head coach, at least in your first year. And things initially won't be comfortable for Trevor Lawrence, okay? But I believe in Urban Meyer as a head coach. I think Trevor Lawrence has good wide receivers. I believe in James Robinson as a running back. I think the Jaguars 
we'll have we'll have a chance to do some good things with all the draft picks they have. And I think Trevor Lawrence is talented enough to stay afloat for the first two to three seasons, despite having some you know, bad players and dysfunction around him. Kind of like Matthew Stafford. You know, Matthew Stafford, he wasn't wowing people in Detroit initially, but he was he was mature enough and talented enough to at least, you know, steer the ship until Detroit became a better football team. Excuse me. So my biggest concern for Trevor Lawrence isn't that can he overcome what's presented to him in Jacksonville. I think Jacksonville is actually an underrated football team. And I believe Trevor Lawrence is talented enough to overcome, you know, some dysfunction, at least initially. I worry about what's inside of Trevor Lawrence because at times Trevor Lawrence, he comes across as a little too casual to me. And recently Trevor Lawrence came out and said, I don't have a chip on my shoulder and I can't manufacture that. And his dad actually said in an interview with Sports Illustrated that Trevor Lawrence is not a I want to win a Super Bowl at all cost type of quarterback. Those concerns bother me. And listen, if someone like Justin Fields, Trey Lance, or Mac Jones said that, they'd be getting crushed 24-7. I mean, Justin Fields, people came out and said Justin Fields has a terrible work ethic. And there was absolutely no proof of that at Ohio State. But because Trevor Lawrence is this, is this Barbie doll for the media, they're going to gloss over this. But I'm not going to do that because... See, the greatest quarterbacks in the world are driven by something day in and day out. Tom Brady is Tom Brady is constantly looking for motivation. Aaron Rodgers constantly looking for motivation. Drew Brees was constantly trying to prove the doubters wrong. And to me, it's hard to find a quarterback out there that isn't finding some type of motivation every single day. And it just seems like Trevor Lawrence doesn't have the sense of urgency, at least initially. Maybe he can develop that sense of urgency. But he initially, as far as what we know today, it doesn't seem like he has the sense of urgency to be great like some of like some of his contemporaries, you know. It's almost like I want Trevor Lawrence to treat every game and every play like as his last. And maybe I'm being too crucial to Trevor Lawrence, but that's why I want for my star quarterback. And maybe Trevor Lawrence is totally wired differently, you know, and this might be hard for Trevor Lawrence because the reality is he's never really truly had to face a ton of adversity. From from high school to college, he had great players around him. He was winning he he's been winning games. He's been coddled. He's had great like like I said, great players around him. The media's always been pumping him up. And he's had the good life so far, I would say. But what's going to happen when the Jacksonville Jaguars media turns on Trevor Lawrence and criticizes him for having a bad stretch? What if the offensive line isn't blocking very well and Trevor Lawrence is getting hit every single play? Is he going to just lay down and say, oh, well, the offensive line is not blocking today. Well, we're going to lose this playoff game. We're going to lose this game today. It's not our year to win a Super Bowl. Or is Trevor Lawrence going to fight back? Is he going to continue to play through adversity? Okay, because in the NFL, when it comes when it comes to the big games and the playoffs, it's all about overcoming adversity. Joe Montana, Tom Brady, Terry Bradshaw, Peyton Manning, you know, those guys often were better when they are when they were trailing in games. It's, it brought the best out of them. Same thing with Patrick Mahomes. At times, Patrick Mahomes, sometimes he plays better when trailing because there's a sense of urgency. There's a joy to his game. And he's a guy that's not going to bail. He's going to fight to, to the whistle blows, okay? And the, the National Football League requires a whole different amount of commitment and maturity. And I think Trevor Lawrence has the maturity down, but I'm not sure if Trevor Lawrence has the drive that's going to make him become as great as he could potentially be. Maybe I'm totally wrong. I'm not going to make any predictions. I'm just going to say right now, I think Trevor Lawrence is going to be a satisfying number one overall pick. However, if he were to fail, those are the reasons why that might potentially be. Sure, the organization might not help him. Sure, you know, sometimes if quarterbacks don't get developed properly, they they flop, but I don't really worry about that too much. But the bottom line is I have questions about Trevor Lawrence, not from a talent perspective, but the intangibles is what I need to see if he has at the NFL level. We'll see if he does. I'm excited to find out. Okay, everyone, I am now going to officially reveal 
my top five quarterback rankings for the 2021 NFL Draft class. I will also reveal my 2021 NFL first round mock draft right here on the show today. I will say that this mock draft was made and released on YouTube before the Orlando Brown trade officially went down. So while the Orlando Brown trade would in hindsight change this mock draft a little bit, I don't think there would have been a whole lot of changes to my mock draft if I would have done it after after the Orlando Brown trade. So I do apologize for the fact that I just couldn't predict time. I couldn't predict I could not predict the fact that the Chiefs and the Ravens were going to make that trade. But either way, I still think my mock draft is very, very good. Something that's going to be very informative informative for you guys. I, I had a lot of fun, you know, researching these players, watching film, and making this mock draft, as well as my top five quarterback rankings. So without further ado, I will release both my top five quarterback rankings for the 2020 NFL draft, as well as my official first round mock draft for this 2021 NFL draft. And here it is officially right here. Hello, everyone, and welcome to the Juice Alert once again. Today, I am going to rank who, in my opinion, are the top five quarterbacks in the 2021 NFL Draft. Now, a lot of people out there, when it comes to the draft season, they want to rank, you know, 10 to 12 prospects at the quarterback position. Listen, I'm not doing all that because, in reality, there's about two, maybe three guys in a single draft that could hit. In fact, you know, some drafts, there's only one quarterback that hits. I mean, Kyler Murray, he looks like the only surefire slam dunk from the 2019 NFL draft based on what we've seen so far, you know. And in hindsight, these rankings don't matter all that much because I truly believe that where a quarterback lands matters. You need great stability. You need great coaching. You need good weapons. You need a good team around you to succeed. And I mean, if Zach Wilson goes to the New York Jets, and Mac Jones goes to the San Francisco 49ers, I'm going to say Mac Jones has the better chance to have the better NFL career just because he's going to a much more stable, you know, organization, and he's going to have a great roster around him. Zach Wilson, maybe not so much. And we also could factor in injuries potentially happening, you know. And keep in mind, these guys, from the point in which they enter the draft to the time in which they reach the NFL, they could get significantly better. These grades are only a starting point for these prospects. You know, this whole thing is a total crapshoot. Tom Brady is not the same quarterback that he was when he was back in Michigan, okay, based on what he is right now. Justin Herbert, if you watched him at Oregon and you watched him his rookie year with the Chargers, totally different quarterback, okay? These guys can get better and better and by the way, I watched every single throw of the five quarterbacks that I'm going to evaluate right here. So I take into account a lot of different things. I evaluate everything. I take pride in my research. So without further ado, let's get started. The top five quarterbacks in the 2021 NFL Draft, I'll go in order from best to worst. Number one is Trevor Lawrence. Number two is Justin Fields. Number three is Trey Lance. Number four is Mac Jones. And number five is Zach Wilson. I'm going to throw in a wild card. I'm going to throw in Kellen Mond into this mix. He is a little bit stiff when he tries to throw the football. He has a lot of things that he needs to clean up from a, from a mechanical perspective. But I do believe that if he lands with a great team and he sits and develops properly, maybe he could surprise a ton of people, a.k.a. Dak Prescott style. Dak Prescott was a fourth-round pick several years ago. He ends up being a franchise quarterback. Tom Brady, he was a sixth-round pick in college. So Kellen Mond's a guy to keep your eye on. But let's go from best to worst. I'm going to start off with the first two quarterbacks, Trevor Lawrence and Justin Fields, because I do believe there are two generational talents at the quarterback position in the 2021 NFL Draft. Tr Justin Fields and Trevor Lawrence. And I believe both of these quarterbacks are in the category of can't-miss prospects, or at least they're the closest thing to it. Let's just put it that way. They're as close to a can't-miss prospect as you can hope for, okay? And let me start with Trevor Lawrence. Trevor Lawrence is a generational talent. The arm strength jumps off the screen when you watch the tape. He's great at scanning the field and going through his progressions. 
And he's a very accurate passer that makes great decisions with the football in his hands. I consider Trevor Lawrence to be more of your classic drop pat drop back passer. You know, he's not gonna be a guy that makes a ton of off script plays 24-7 like Aaron Rodgers, like Patrick Mahomes, but he definitely can move around and make plays and extend plays outside the pocket. He can fit the ball into the tightest of windows. He's a very underrated throw he's a very underrated runner of the football. In open space, he moves around pretty well in the pocket. He's shown the ability to throw under pressure. He's won big games. He he defeated Nick Saban as a freshman. Nick Saban's defense, he beat them as a freshman in college at Clemson. Trevor Lawrence is everything you look for in a prospect. And if Trevor Lawrence doesn't become one of the 5 to 10 best quarterbacks in all football, like people project him to become, okay, I still believe that his floor allows him to be an above-average franchise quarterback. And by the way, if you're the Jaguars, you know, if Justin Fields, Trey Lance, or Mac Jones turns out to be better than Trevor Lawrence, you can at least live with it because Trevor Lawrence, he's a very safe pick with a ton of upside. I like him a lot. Justin Fields, to me, is the number two quarterback on my board. Like I said, he's a generational talent. He has all the elite traits that you look for in some of the best quarterbacks in the NFL. I believe his best quality is his decision-making. He doesn't throw a ton of interceptions. He will not put the ball in harm's way. And his ability to make big plays down the field with his rocket for an arm, to me, is his bet is one of his better traits as well. He also ran the 40-yard dash in 4.41 seconds, which is pretty big time speed for a quarterback. At times, he looks like a running back in the open field. Mechanically, at times, Justin Fields can get a little bit erratic. I do think that if Justin Fields lands with a dysfunctional organization or or with a bad roster, he more than likely probably is not going to develop into a franchise quarterback. But that's pretty much a knock against any quarterback out there unless you're, you know, Aaron Rodgers, you know, or this all-time great talent at quarterback where you can overcome bad coaching and dysfunction. A lot of these quarterbacks can't do that. And I don't think Justin Fields is going to be able to overcome a ton of dysfunction. But I'm a big-time believer in what Justin Fields brings to the table. He's the number two quarterback on my board. Trey Lance, for me, is the number three quarterback on my board now. What you must take into account when evaluating Trey Lance is the guy is only 20 years old, okay? So he's super duper young. And he's only at 17 college starts. And I don't think Trey Lance is ready day number one when he enters the NFL to be an effective franchise quarterback, okay? And he didn't play the best competition in college, and he ran a very simple offense at North Dakota State. That needs to be factored into his evaluation. I'm factoring that in. That's why he's not quite at the top, you know. But what you are drafting Trey Lance for is what he can become. And I believe Trey Lance can become a great franchise quarterback if developed properly because he has great arm talent, because the arm strength pops off the screen, because he processes information very quickly, because he makes great decisions with the football, because he has very good mobility. He has everything you look for in a great franchise quarterback. He throws a great deep ball, might be the best deep ball thrower in this draft. I have him at number three on my big board. Mac Jones, for me, is at number four on my big board as far as quarterbacks go. I think Mac Jones has a chance to surprise a lot of people in the NFL. And if it were not for Trevor Lawrence, Justin Fields, and Trey Lance, you know, entering this draft, I would have Mac Jones a lot higher. The reason why I don't have Mac Jones higher on my board is because Trevor Lawrence, Justin Fields, and Trey Lance have a lot of the same qualities as Mac Jones, but they just have much more God-given talent at their disposal. But Mac Jones, he's an NFL-ready quarterback at this stage based on where he's at, you know. I think that he processes information very quickly. He's an accurate thrower of the football. He naturally is able to throw the deep ball pretty well down the field. And I think he has underrated arm strength and underrated mobility within the pocket. He's not going to run around and make a ton of plays, but just like Tom Brady, just like Drew Brees, just like Peyton Manning in the past, he's shown the ability to kind of, you know, have that good pocket presence and buy time when he needs to in the pocket, okay? And at the very least, I see Mac Jones being a solid, viable option in the NFL at the quarterback position. He has a chance to become a franchise quarterback. However, if he lands with a team that, that has a bad offensive line and not great weapons around him, things could get rocky. But I do like him as a prospect. My number five quarterback on my big board is Zach Wilson. 
I do think Zach Wilson is an overrated prospect. I'm much lower on Zach Wilson than most people. And the reason why is because I've been hearing the comparisons of Patrick Mahomes, Aaron Rodgers, Kyler Murray, Baker Mayfield to Zach Wilson. I just don't see that. You know, he's not those guys, okay? But there are things that I truly do like about his game. He's an accurate passer that consistently throws the football with a tight spiral, okay? You know, that spiral definitely can cut through the wind if need be, okay? Does he have a dynamic arm? No, but it's a solid, good, firm NFL arm to me. He does move around the pocket fairly well, and he's shown the ability to throw the football from different arm angles, which does give him sort of a little get-out-of-jail-free card. My worries about Zach Wilson, however, is that he did not play within a lot of tight pockets in college. What that means is there weren't a whole lot of bodies around him in the pocket. He had great protection at times at BYU, and he was bad under pressure, and when the pocket got really crowded and tight around him, and also to me, he holds on to the football way too long, and he tries to play out of structure a little bit too much for my liking. He doesn't have great self-awareness in that regard, and he's had injuries in the past. He does have a smaller frame, and versus in college, okay, so in college, versus teams that won 10 or more games. He was 0-5. He threw one touchdown pass to seven interceptions and had a 62% completion percentage. I worry about Zach Wilson at the next level. I think he needs to go to a team with a very creative play caller that will allow him to make plays off schedule and be himself, you know, and allow him to just do his thing, you know. And I think that Zach Wilson does have some good, nice traits. But I would not be shocked if Zach Wilson ends up being the Josh Rosen of this class. There is some major bust potential. But I do think he has some nice traits that he brings to the table. No doubt about it. Okay, I'm not going to sink him as a prospect. And if it were not for so many good quarterbacks being in this class... I have Zach Wilson much higher, but unfortunately, he gets the number five spot for me. But he could develop into a good franchise quarterback one day. However, if he lands with the Jets, I'm not so sure. But that's my list of quarterbacks in this, you know, draft class as far as the top five rankings. Number one is Trevor Lawrence. Number two is Justin Fields. Number three is Trey Lance. Number four is Mac Jones. Number five is Zach Wilson. And my wild card sort of mystery quarterback is Kellen Mond out of Texas A&M. Okay, so now I'm going to officially bring out my 2021 NFL first round mock draft. Now, this mock draft is based on what I personally would do as an NFL general manager. I'm not going to try to predict what these teams are going to do, okay? That's way too hard. There are actually no trades in this mock draft because I, th- I felt that was a little bit too complicated. This is what I would do if I was the general manager of these 32 teams, let's start off with the number one overall pick, the Jacksonville Jaguars. They should select Trevor Lawrence, the quarterback out of Clemson. And by the way, I'll just go over the first, you know, four picks. So I have Trevor Lawrence going number one to the Jaguars, Justin Fields going number two to the Jets, Trey Lance going number three to the 49ers, and at number four, I had the Falcons taking Kyle Pitts. Let's start off with the Jaguars. Trevor Lawrence, like I said in the past, he's a generational talent. He has great arm strength. He's very accurate. He He's very good at reading defenses. He has underrated mobility. And there are a lot of great quarterbacks in this draft class. But I believe that you have to take Trevor Lawrence with the number one overall pick just because you don't want to live with that regret. If Justin Fields, you know, Trey Lance or Mac Jones ends up being the best quarterback from this class, so be it. I'm not going to take that risk and, you know, just say, okay, I passed on Trevor Lawrence and then years from now I could regret it, you know, okay? And even if Trevor Lawrence doesn't become a top five to top ten quarterback one day, I still believe he could become an above-average franchise quarterback that you can win a lot of games with because he's super talented and his floor is super high, but the upside is truly there as well. Justin Fields to the Jets for me, very similar to Trevor Lawrence. He has those elite traits you look for, and his ability to make plays out of structure is definitely very, very good. He's an accurate passer. I think that most people are overthinking Justin Fields. They're trying to, you know, pick apart it pick apart his flaws, and I don't think he has as many flaws as people want to point out, you know, and I do believe that he would be a significant upgrade over Sam Darnold, at least from a talent perspective. Justin Fields has a chance to become a really good franchise quarterback, and he would be a slam dunk pick for the New York Jets. I consider him a generational talent. Number three overall, 
like I said, I have Trey Lance going to the 49ers. They obviously are moving up to the number three spot to move on from Jimmy Garoppolo. And this roster is great right now. But the reason why the 49ers, to me, are not quite the team they could become is because I don't think Jimmy Garoppolo or any quarterback on their roster is quite good enough to get San Francisco over the hump. Okay, two years ago in the Super Bowl, we saw Jimmy Garoppolo not be able to get it done when it matters most. And the 49ers arguably were better than the Chiefs, but because the Chiefs had Patrick Mahomes and the 49ers did not, they ended up stealing that Super Bowl away from San Francisco. Trey Lance is smart. He processes information very quickly. He's everything you look for in a Kyle Shanahan type of quarterback. He's a great deep ball thrower. He's able to run the football effectively when needed to at the quarterback position. Got a big time arm. He'd be a great pick. Now, for the Atlanta Falcons, I'm going to say this right now. If Trevor Lawrence, Justin Fields, or Trey Lance are on the board, you need to take at least one of those quarterbacks. Those three quarterbacks are too good to pass up on if you're Atlanta. I'm a little bit lower on Mac Jones and Zach Wilson, so I would probably choose, you know, getting a better player over those guys. That's why I would, you know, target Kyle Pitts. I would, okay? Because... Matt Ryan is 35 years old, and while he is aging, I do believe if you put a great roster around Matt Ryan, he can start to win you a lot of football games, okay? And Atlanta could look to add defense right here, but you can address the cornerback position or the linebacker position later in the draft. Kyle Pitts, he'd be an excellent target for an aging quarterback and Matt Ryan. Listen, Matt Ryan is past his prime, so you need to put as many good weapons around him as you can. Kyle Pitts is 6'4", 240 pounds. He's a really good, versatile tight end that could end up playing wide receiver at the next level. If you pair him with Julio Jones and Calvin Ridley, that'd be super-duper great. So Kyle Pitts to the Falcons makes a ton of sense. Up next, the, the next four picks, I have the Bengals taking Pene, Pene Sewell out of Oregon. I have the Dolphins taking Devontae Smith. I have the Lions taking Jamar Chase. And the Panthers taking Patrick Sertain, the quarterback out of Alabama. Let's start with Cincinnati. Pene Sewell is regarded by a lot of people as the best offensive line prospect since Quentin Nelson. And Cincinnati's offensive line is not very good. And Joe Burrow this past year just tore his ACL. So you have, so you now have some injury concerns with Joe Burrow, even though he's an awesome quarterback with healthy. Okay. And a lot of people say you could go Jamar Chase right here. I don't understand that, but I think that it really doesn't matter how many great weapons you have if you can't protect the quarterback. Did you guys not watch the Super Bowl? The so-called next GOAT, Patrick Mahomes, was running for his life, and it didn't matter that he had Tyreek Hill or Travis Kelsey because the offensive line couldn't protect him. Pene Sewell would be a slam dunk pick for the Bengals. He's strong. He's big. He'd be a cornerstone that offensive line for years. Number six overall, I have Devontae Smith, the Alabama wide receiver, going to Miami. If someone like Justin Fields is on the board, I'm moving on from Tua Tagovailoa, but that's not the case right here, okay? So, look, Miami, they have a great defense, a great coaching staff, but they need more dynamic weapons on the outside of wide receiver. They did sign Will Fuller in for agency, but I think Devontae Smith would really complete that wide receiver core. He's a really good route runner, and he'd be an excellent fit for the Miami Dolphins offense, he could be the weapon that Tua is looking for. And I don't think Tua is a special quarterback. So you need to put a lot of talent around him. Devontae Smith makes a ton of sense. The Detroit Lions at number seven, they should take Jamar Chase, wide receiver, out of LSU. You just lost Kenny Galladay. You just lost Marvin Jones. As of right now, the Detroit Lions have one of the worst wide receiver cores in the National Football League. In order to properly evaluate Jared Goff, you need to put weapons around him, okay? And Jamar Chase, I think he's a tad bit overrated as a prospect, but he's super dynamic. He had a great season a year ago at LSU. You know, he's really dynamic with the ball in his hands. I have my questions, but I think he's a dynamic weapon that really could help out Jared Goff. Up next, Patrick Sertain to the Carolina Panthers, the cornerback out of Alabama. I would love to get Sam Darnold another weapon, maybe a Kyle Pitts if he's there, but he's not there in this mock draft. And I think the Carolina Panthers need about one or two more pieces to really complete their defense, and they need a shutdown corner on the outside to really make that defense work. 
okay, and really to complete that unit. So I'm not passing on Patrick Sertain right here. He's very smart. He's he's very instinctive. He's a ball hawk. He's everything you look for in a great defensive back in the NFL. He does have a, a good amount of potential. I pick him at the number eight spot. At number nine overall, I have the Denver Broncos selecting Jeremiah Owusa Kwamora, the linebacker out of Notre Dame. He's a very versatile middle linebacker that has, in my opinion, the ability to be a Pro Bowl middle linebacker from day number one in the NFL. He he, you can make the argument he's one of the five best players in this draft. He's super duper rangy. He ha he has tremendous versatility, great instincts. He's a great tackler in open space. And in a division with Patrick Mahomes and Justin Herbert, you need game changers on your defense. The Broncos could look to move on from Drew Locke, but I think that because guys like Justin Fields are off the board, you should just look to stick with Drew Locke for another year. I take the middle linebacker out of Notre Dame right here with the number nine overall pick. Up next, the Dallas Cowboys. I have them selecting J.C. Horn the cornerback out of South Carolina. Dallas has a great offense when their offense is healthy, but defensively they are a below average unit. So I have them selecting J.C. Horn. J.C. Horn, if he reaches his full potential, he legitimately could be a top 10 cornerback in the NFL. He's that good. I have the Dallas Cowboys selecting him with the number 10 overall pick. At number 11 overall, the Giants, they should select Jalen Waddle, the wide receiver out of Alabama. The reason why is because he's arguably the most explosive player in this entire draft. And if you put him opposite of Kenny Galladay, you know, along with Darius Slayton, that's a really, really good, well above average wide receiver core. I don't think Daniel Jones is the greatest quarterback in the world. So if, so if I have, in my by my standards, an average to a below average quarterback, I need to put every single weapon around him in order for him to succeed. So I like this pick right here for the Giants. Number 12 overall, I believe the Eagles should take Rashad Bateman, wide receiver out of Minnesota. Philadelphia's offense is not very dynamic, and I do think Jalen Hurts has potential, but I don't see Jalen Hurts ever being, you know, a top 10 to a top 5 quarterback, so I think you need a lot of weapons around him to get the most out of him, okay? And so, if you have a young quarterback, you need to give him every opportunity to succeed. Rashad Bateman could be... From day number one, the best wide receiver on the Philadelphia Eagles roster. That's without a doubt in my mind. Okay, he runs great routes. He has great, he has great speed in the open field. And he could be the number one wide receiver the Philadelphia Eagles are looking for. Okay, the next four teams up are the Chargers, the Vikings, the Patriots, and the Cardinals. At number 13 overall, I have Rashawn Slater going to the Los Angeles Chargers. If someone like J.C. Horn or Patrick Sertain are on the board for the Chargers, they'd be hard to pass up on. But I do think that they desperately need offensive line help to protect Justin Herbert. Rashawn Slater is a big, strong, very versatile offensive lineman out of Northwestern. He could be a cornerstone to their offensive line for a long time. It'd be a great pick at number 13 overall. Minnesota at number 14 overall. I have them selecting Jalen Phillips, the defensive end slash outside linebacker out of Miami. Minnesota last year was bottom five in sacks. Now, Daniil Hunter is great. He's excellent, but you need someone else opposite of Daniil Hunter to really make this defense work in Minnesota. Phillips is athletic. He provides some versatility, and he has some legitimate upside. And I do believe with Mike, Sim with Mike Zimmer being a defensive-minded head coach, I truly believe he could get the most I have a guy like Jalen Phillips. Now, in the past, I've said Minnesota needs to trade up for a quarterback, but right here, I don't think there's a quarterback on the board currently that's worth trading up for. So as a result, they should take Jalen Phillips. Number 15 overall, I have the Patriots selecting Deame Brown, the wide receiver out of North Carolina. Now, before you guys knock the pick and say I'm crazy and an idiot for putting him in the first round of my mock draft, I want to ask you all a question. Have you guys actually watched this guy at North Carolina at all? Because I'm pretty sure a lot of people don't know who Deame Brown is. So after you're watching this mock draft, turn on some Deame Brown tape and then make the evaluation for yourself. Because to me, he's a first-round wide receiver. He can walk in day number one to New England and be the most talented wide receiver on their roster. The Patriots need a number one wide receiver. They could trade up for Trey Lance or Justin Fields. I have a problem with that, but those two guys are gone. So I have the Patriots selecting Deame Brown out of North Carolina. To me, 
it's a sneaky good pick because a lot of people are sleeping on Deami Brown. I think he could be really, really good. Number 16 overall, I have the Cardinals selecting Micah Parsons, the linebacker out of Penn State. Arizona has a great offense led by Kyler Murray. And now that they've added J.J. Watt to go pair up with Chandler Jones on the edge, you know, to get after the quarterback. They have a solid pass rush. They have a good, they have a good offense. But I think that they still could use some help in their secondary and in their linebacker core. And if I have an opportunity to pair Micah Parsons with a guy like, I don't know, Isaiah Simmons, I'm going to do it more times than not. Micah Parsons and Isaiah Simmons teamed up together have a chance to be an elite middle linebacker duo in the NFL. Micah Parsons, he's a super freaky athlete. He's great. He's great at rushing the quarterback. He's great at stopping the run as well. He's a plug and play starter from day number one, and he make a big time impact on that Cardinals defense, in my opinion. Okay, up next, we're going to talk about the Raiders, the Dolphins, the Washington football team, and the Chicago Bears. I believe that the Raiders at number 17 overall, I believe they should select Christian Barmore, the defensive tackle out of Alabama. He's arguably the best defensive tackle in this draft class. He's really good at getting after the quarterback, and he has a lot of upside, okay? And he has a chance to really be an impactful defensive tackle at the next level, and the Raiders' defense isn't very good, and they just lost Maurice Hurst, so I believe they should target Christian Barmore. Now, the Miami Dolphins at number 18 overall, they should select Tevin Jenkins out of Oklahoma State, the offensive lineman. Okay, earlier earlier in this mock draft, I had Miami taking Devontae Smith, so they've got a number one wide receiver to pair up with Will Fuller potentially, okay? You know, and this could really solidify their offensive line right here. You know, you have a potential star wide receiver in Devontae Smith. Now you have Tevin Jenkins. To me, that's a pretty good first round for the Miami Dolphins of the 2021 NFL Draft. Now, right here at number 19 and number 20 overall, you have Washington and you have Chicago. Two teams that are desperate for franchise quarterbacks. And this is the dream scenario for both teams. Washington gets Mac Jones and Chicago gets Zach Wilson. Both teams have pretty solid rosters with really good defenses and actually pretty good weapons, but they don't have quarterbacks, okay? So I think Washington definitely needs to take a quarterback if someone like Mac Jones is available. And I've been taking Mac Jones. He's an accurate passer. He processes information very quickly. He has underrated arm strength, and he'd be the perfect quarterback for Washington, okay? And Zach Wilson, he provides some playmaking ability for the Chicago Bears. The Chicago Bears just moved on from Mitchell Trubisky, which was the right move, but I don't think Andy Dalton fits today's NFL, and I don't think he's an effective starter anymore. At least he's, you know, he could be a starting quarterback, but I don't think he's going to scare any NFL defenses. I don't see you being able to win multiple playoff games with Andy Dalton. And look, I'm not the biggest Zach Wilson fan, but why not take a flyer on the guy, Matt Nagy and Ryan Pace, the head coach and general manager in Chicago. They're on the hot seat. They need a star quarterback that they can sell to the fan base. And who knows, Zach Wilson very well could turn into a great franchise quarterback in Chicago. I worry about him behind that offensive line, but based on where he's at on the board right here, this be a good pick for Chicago. Number 21 overall, I have the Colts, I have the Indianapolis Colts selecting Christian Darisaw out of Virginia Tech. Anthony Costanzo just retired, so you need to fill that hole at offensive tackle. And Christian Darisaw can come right in day number one and be a star for them. And one thing we know about Carson Wentz is the, the book is out on him. He is bad with pressure in his face. So you need to really solidify that offensive line for him. It'd be a good pick. For the Colts, let's talk about the Titans, the Jets, and the Steelers. So the Titans are up next. Are num- they're up next at number twenty-two? I have them selecting Caleb Farley, cornerback out of Virginia Tech. And this pick right here has the potential to be to be an absolute steal, just because a lot of people labeled Caleb Farley 
as the number one defensive back heading into you know this uh, this past college football season. He his stock has you know dropped a little bit, but he's a playmaking defensive back. He's gonna take risks. And he's gonna make plays. He may get burned every now and then, but he makes a ton of plays. He has the ideal size. He has the ideal playmaking ability to be a number one defensive back in the NFL. And Tennessee, they have holes all over their defense. I believe it'd be a great pick. At number 23 overall, I have the Jets selecting Travis Etienne, the running back out of Clemson. I'm usually not one of those guys that likes to pick a running back in the first round, even though Saquon Barkley, you know, Josh Jacobs, and the Christian McCaffreys of the world, they've shown that they've been worth a first round pick. I just think you can go cheap on running back, but... If you're going to draft Justin Fields or Zach Wilson or whoever you may choose at quarterback in New York, you need to give them a solid running game because right now the Jets, they have one of the what they have one of the worst running back cores in all football. They need a, they need some playmakers at the running back position. Travis Etienne's a home run hitter with truly elite speed. He has underrated power to his game, so I have no problem giving him the football 20 times a game, you know, giving him the ball in between the tackles. And he's shown the ability to be a more than reliable pass catcher, so he'd be a great pick for the Jets. Elijah Vera Tucker out of USC, to me, is a perfect fit for the Pittsburgh Steelers, who have an aging offensive line. They need to get younger on the offensive line. They need to start preparing for the future, in my opinion. Tucker is versatile. He's a very solid run blocker and pass blocker. It'd be a great pick for the Pittsburgh Steelers. Number 25 overall, I believe the Jaguars should select Gregory Rousseau, the defensive end out of Miami. You got your franchise quarterback in Trevor Lawrence. Now I think you should really start to focus on your defense because with DJ Chark and LaVisca Chanel being your good, being your wide receivers on the outside, along with James Robinson at running back. I think Trevor Lawrence has a chance to come in and do some good things on offense, okay? Now, Gregory Rousseau is extremely raw. He needs some coaching, you know, but I think that if he develops properly under Urban Meyer, you could really find a special pass rusher to pair up next to Josh Allen, who's already one of the best young pass rushers in all football. I think it'd be a great pick for the Jaguars. Now, let's go over... The Cleveland Browns pick, the Ravens pick, and the Saints pick, okay? Cleveland, to me, has one of the most loaded rosters in all of football. So I think that they need to fill their one glaring hole, and that's middle linebacker. Why not go get Jamin Davis out of Florida, who's a solid playmaking middle linebacker, someone you can use in coverage, someone that has the ability to stop the run, and hopefully, and hopefully round out this Cleveland Browns defense. He'd be a good pick right here in the first round. I have the Ravens selecting Terrence Marshall, the wide receiver out of LSU. We've seen some really good LSU wide receivers like Oda Beckham Jr. and Justin Jefferson come into the NFL and, de- and from day number one just be dominant forces of nature. And I truly believe Terrence Marshall could surprise some people if he develops in Baltimore properly and if they use him the right way. At times, he looks like Mike Evans in the open field. He's a big, tall wide receiver that has really good speed in the open space. And the Ravens need a true number one wide receiver. So I think that you go get Terrence Marshall. You pair Terrence Marshall up with Sammy Watkins, Marquise Hollywood Brown, and Mark Andrews. Now Lamar Jackson might have enough weapons to win the, to win the Super Bowl. But we'll see. The New Orleans Saints, to me, they need another cornerback opposite of Marshawn Lattimore. And that guy, to me, should be Asante Samuel Jr., just based on the way the draft board has worked out. They have a fair, the Saints have a fairly talented roster already, but they need another cornerback opposite of Lattimore. They could address the wide receiver position later in the draft. I know they just lost Emmanuel Sanders, but they still have Michael Thomas. And like I said, you can get a wide receiver later in this draft. Samuel has great instincts. He has, he has very good speed and he's a willing tackler. He'd be a great pick for the Saints, especially where they get him. He could end up being a steal. And last but not least, the last four picks. Of the 2021 NFL Draft, you know, the Packers, the Bills, the Chiefs, and the Buccaneers, four teams that are looking to try to win a Super Bowl right here, right now. At least we hope Green Bay is doing that. At least we hope they're not drafting for the future. In my mock draft, Green Bay is going all in to help out Aaron Rodgers 
And why not go out there and help improve that defense? Because the defense for years has been the problem in Green Bay. It's never been Aaron Rodgers and the offense's fault. It's always been the defense's fault, okay? Green Bay needs another playmaking cornerback opposite of Jair Alexander because they're really close to winning a Super Bowl right now. If they fix their defensive issues, they could very well win a Super Bowl with Aaron Rodgers as their quarterback, okay? And Eric Stokes, to me, out of Georgia – would be a great pick for the Green Bay Packers at this spot. He's a ball-hawking cornerback with tremendous speed. He plays great man coverage, and he's very good in zone coverage as well. So he'd be a great pick. Number 30 overall, the Buffalo Bills. I have them selecting Najee Harris, the running back out of Alabama. I'm not a huge fan of Zach Moss or Devin Singletary. And at times, the Buffalo Bills offense relied on Josh Allen, Way too much to make plays for them, especially in the run game. So why not take some of the pressure off of Josh Allen and go get Najee Harris? They do have a couple of defensive holes to fill, but you could do that later in the draft. Harris is a three-down running back that fits this Buffalo Bills offense. He'd be a great pick. The Kansas City Chiefs, to me, they should select Samuel Cosme out of Texas. He's a really good offensive lineman that really could help them fill their hole at offensive tackle. They did add Joe Tooney in the offseason, but they still have a hole at offensive tackle. He'd be a great pick right here. And last but not least, the final pick of this mock draft for my 2021 NFL mock draft is Kellen Mond. I have Kellen Mond going to the Tampa Bay Buccaneers with the number 32 overall pick. He's a quarterback out of Texas A&M, and the Tampa Bay Buccaneers just won the Super Bowl, right? And to me, they're a stacked roster. They're, they still, to, th to this day, have the best roster in all football. So really, all they're doing is drafting to fill out the depth on their roster. So to me, they have the ability to take risks and really just, you know, pull take a flyer on a player like Kellen Mond. And Kellen Mond, to me, could really benefit from sitting behind Tom Brady because Kellamon, he's very stiff. You know, his mechanics to me at times can get really, really rocky. I believe that Kellamon, if he sits for a year or two behind Tom Brady, and if he irons out those issues, he could be the perfect quarterback for Bruce Arians' offense. I know Kellamon has problems. And to be quite honest with you, I don't have a first-round grade on Kellen Mond, but I do believe that if he develops properly, he could be more than worth a first-round pick, and he could potentially be a well-above-average franchise quarterback that makes plays. And listen, Tom Brady is 44 years old. Eventually, you're going to have to play. You're going to have to plan for the future because Tom Brady, he's not going to play till he's 50 years old. Okay, eventually, over the next couple of years, Tom Brady will be retiring. Why not go get a successor? in this draft when you don't have a whole bunch of needs to fill in the first place. So that right there, people, is my official 2021 NFL first round mock draft. Well, I hope you guys enjoy my quarterback rankings and my mock draft. If you have questions about it or you disagree with some of those picks and those rankings, if you're listening on YouTube, be sure to comment in the comment section where you disagree with me. We can have a nice, you know, civil conversation. And also, if you're on social media, you know, Twitter, Instagram, hit me up and, and let me know what you guys think about those rankings, okay? So, I now want to move on to talking about the San Francisco 49ers, a team that recently, several weeks ago, traded up to the number three overall pick. And in my opinion, this is a move San Francisco is making to obviously go up and select a quarterback. And it's been reported that they, they that they actually already have come to terms as to which quarterback they are going to draft. So the organization's all in on one guy, and they've traded up from the, from the number 12 spot to the number 3 spot to go select their guy to potentially get them over the hump and to win a Super Bowl. And I like this move for the San Francisco 49ers because, you know, there's a trend in the NFL, and really in sports, that the aggressive teams are winning. The Kansas City Chiefs, they trade up for Patrick Mahomes. They don't regret it for one second. The Tampa Bay Buccaneers, they signed Tom Brady. They went all in on Tom Brady. They won a Super Bowl immediately. The New Orleans Saints, they went all in on Drew Brees the past couple of years. They've been a Super Bowl contender, t contender every single year. The Buffalo Bills, they've taken big swings. 
and and they made aggressive moves to go to go and help Josh Allen. It's paid off. That Stephon Diggs trade definitely paid off this past year. No doubt about it. Might have been the trade of the year. Okay, Baltimore. They traded back into the first round, just like Lamar Jackson. They don't regret that. The Brooklyn Nets, the Los Angeles Lakers, the Dodgers, the Warriors. These franchises are making moves and competing for and winning titles immediately. Teams like Green Bay, you know, the Celtics, the Cincinnati Reds, not so much. They're not getting over the hump because they're just not aggressive enough, you know. And the thing about Jimmy Garoppolo is this. Look, I do think Jimmy Garoppolo gives you a chance to win football games if he's on your roster, if you put a good team and a good coaching staff around him, okay? But I don't consider Jimmy Garoppolo to be one of the 15 to 20 most talented quarterbacks in the NFL. I think the 49ers realize that they're good right now, but they have a chance to become great if they move on from Jimmy Garoppolo and upgraded quarterback. And who cares about draft picks, people? Listen, a lot of those draft picks that they're going to be selecting, the, the, a lot of those guys aren't going to start for the 49ers initially because, because this roster is loaded. Imagine if the 49ers drafted Kyle Pitts. Kyle Pitts is awesome, but guess what? He'd be the second tight end on their depth chart behind George Kittle. That is how talented the San Francisco 49ers roster is. Kyle Pitts, a guy that's an elite prospect that people are saying might be the greatest tight end prospect of all time. He's going to be entering this NFL draft. And if, San Francisco, and if San Francisco were to draft him, he would not be the day one starter at tight end. Sure, he'd get playing time, but he's not playing over George Kittle. George Kittle's amazing, okay? And I believe the San Francisco 49ers should do, and I believe they are doing, exactly what the Kansas City Chiefs did. A couple of years ago, when the Chiefs moved on from Alex Smith, the Chiefs realized they were a good team with Alex Smith, but not quite good enough to win a Super Bowl. If San Francisco can get their hands on a guy like Justin Fields, Trey Lance, maybe Zach Wilson if he falls to you. I'm not the biggest Zach Wilson fan, but we'll see. If they can get their hands on a star quarterback like Justin Fields or Trey Lance, and they can develop that guy properly, and if that guy stays healthy, the sky is the absolute limit. For this 49ers team, the San, Francisco, the San Francisco 49ers, whether they want to admit it or not, there is a ceiling with Jimmy Garoppolo as their quarterback. It just is. That's the reality. Okay, so that's how I feel about the 49ers. I love the move for them trading up to number three overall. You got to be aggressive in this league, and the 49ers are an aggressive team, and they potentially could be rewarded with it, re rewarded potentially with a super ring if things work out. So the 49ers, there's been some rumors that they potentially could look to draft Alabama quarterback Mac Jones. And obviously the 49ers, they trade up to the, to the number three overall spot in the 2021 NFL draft, obviously to take a quarterback. And multiple reports have come out that the 49ers, there's a good chance they could select Mac Jones. And look, I actually do like what Mac Jones brings to the table. I believe... If I were to choose between Mac Jones being overrated or underrated as a prospect, I'm going to choose Mac Jones as a prospect being underrated because I do believe Mac Jones has underrated arm strength. I do believe he makes great decisions with the football. He's an accurate quarterback. And I understand why Kyle Shanahan might captivate towards a quarterback like Mac Jones because the comparisons that Mac Jones as a prospect has been drawing in regards to NFL quarterbacks is a lot of people have compared him to Kirk Cousins and Matt Ryan. They've said if Mac Jones hits his ceiling, he potentially could become Matt Ryan, a former league MVP. And if he doesn't quite hit, he could potentially be Kirk Cousins, a guy that maybe he's not good enough to win you a Super Bowl, but he's a very solid NFL starting quarterback. And Kyle Shanahan has worked with Kirk Cousins in the past. And he's worked with Matt Ryan in the past. And they almost and they almost won a Super Bowl together. And I think when 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 Kyle Shanahan sees Mac Jones, he sees a little bit of both of those guys. But see here's the thing. When I see Kirk Cousins and Matt Ryan, I see good quarterbacks, but not great quarterbacks. Kirk Cousins, he's good. But he has limit, but he has limited mobility. He's got an average arm, and he has a losing record versus very high quality teams. Matt Ryan, he's good, 
But outside of his one MVP season, he's never been an elite quarterback. In fact, Matt Ryan has missed the playoffs seven times during his 13-year career. Missed the playoffs more than half of his career. And look, Mac Jones is really good. So when I tell you the 49ers should not draft Mac Jones, this has nothing to do with Mac Jones as a prospect. It more so has something to do with, I don't know, Justin Fields and Trey Lance and guys like that just being flat out better than Mac Jones, okay? Why would you trade up in the first round to go select Mac Jones with the number three overall pick when you can grab Justin Fields or Trey Lance or someone like that? Guys that can do virtually the same thing as Mac Jones but have more God-given talent and ability. To me, the 49ers would be settling and playing it safe if they draft Mac Jones. And look, the 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 knock the, the the what people are gonna say they're defending Mac Jones is oh, but Mac Jones is NFL ready right now. Folks, this is not about just one year. This is about the big picture. Do you want to be great next year? Or do you want to be great for the next five to ten years? Because if you develop Justin Fields and or Trey Lance properly, they are they have a chance to be great for the next five to ten, maybe 15 years if you put a great roster around them. And by the way, if I plug Justin Fields into this 49ers roster and he starts from day one, I believe you can win ten games with Justin Fields right off the bat. Now, I would prefer that Justin Fields sit on the bench, but I like what Justin Fields brings to the table. Now, Trey Lance, he played – at a smaller school versus not the greatest competition. So he and he he has he has only one year of a starting sample size. So he might need to sit for another year. But how come everyone knocks Trey Lance for only starting one year, but they don't knock Mac Jones for only starting for one full season at Alabama? Sometimes the one those one year starters don't automatically hit. And look, if the 49ers do draft Mac Jones, look, he's gonna win them games. He's probably not going to be a bust because it's hard to be a bust when your head coach is Kyle Shanahan, when you've got really good running backs, uh, one of the top 10 offensive lines in all football, one of the top 10 offensive skill positions at your disposal in the NFL, along with an elite defense when healthy. It's hard to fail as a quarterback when that's your situation. But I'm here to tell you right now, I don't think the 49ers are going to be an elite team year in and year out, like they should be if Mac Jones is their quarterback, especially in a division with Russell Wilson, Kyler Murray, and Matthew Stafford, okay? I'd rather take a big swing on a guy like Trey Lance or Justin Fields. And usually if you have the fourth best quarterback in your division, you don't always win that division year in and year out. There's a reason why Aaron Rodgers consistently wins his division. It's because he's the best quarterback in that division. Same thing with Peyton Manning back in the day. He always won the division. Because he was the best quarterback in the division. Okay? And you are in no rush to play Justin Fields or Trevor or, or Trey Lance. You're in no rush. You got Jimmy Garoppolo. What's the rush? You won games with, with Jimmy Garoppolo. You got into a Super Bowl with Jimmy Garoppolo. Just take your shot for one year and then move on. Okay? We understand Garoppolo's had injuries. There's a ceiling there. And by the way, does Mac Jones have a higher ceiling than Jimmy Garoppolo? Yes, he does. But is it by a wide margin? I'm going to say no. I think Jimmy Garoppolo and Mac Jones are very similar players. And Jimmy Garoppolo got to a Super Bowl in his first year as the full-time starter in San Francisco. If you're going to draft Mac Jones, you might as well keep Jimmy Garoppolo and put a great team around him. Because to me, you're not significantly upgrading if you draft Mac Jones, if you draft Mac Jones, you're not significantly upgrading. The only thing you're doing is getting Mac Jones on that rookie contract, which is really good. But why not get Justin Fields or Trey Lance on that on that rookie contract? Or maybe Zach Wilson if he falls to you, okay? I don't understand why there's so much, you know, buzz about Mac Jones with the 49ers. If I'm Kyle Shanahan, I need to take risks. And if Kyle Shanahan doesn't want to develop Justin Fields or Trey Lance, then guess what? He doesn't deserve to get over the hump and win a Super Bowl because it takes a lot of hard work to get over the hump. 
Okay, Kyle Shanahan, listen, do a little bit of dirty work because in reality, if you develop Justin Fields and Trey Lance properly, you're going to be rewarded big time. So if I'm the 49ers, I'm not going cheap on a quarterback. I'm drafting someone like Trevor, not Trevor Lawrence. I'm drafting someone like Justin Fields or Trey Lance because those guys are just flat out more talented and have a higher ceiling than Mac Jones. It's nothing against Mac Jones, but compared to guys like Justin Fields, it's not even close to me as far as talent-wise and evaluating who's the better prospect, in my opinion. And I want to talk about Zach Wilson. I've been very critical of Zach Wilson. I've said in the past I believe he's an overrated and overhyped prospect. That doesn't mean he's a bad prospect. I do like what, what Zach Wilson brings to the table. I just think that he's being overrated and overhyped by by evaluators, you know, and things like that. And I just see more bust potential than people are willing to admit, okay? And I recently just talked about how the 49ers should not draft Mac Jones. And the argument isn't because Mac Jones isn't a good prospect. The argument was because there are just flat out better options than Mac Jones. I feel like the 49ers would be settling if they draft Mac Jones. Because I don't think there's a huge difference between Mac Jones and Jimmy Garoppolo in hindsight. Okay. Maybe Mac Jones has a slightly higher ceiling, you know, but I don't, I see very similar players. Okay. And I now want to shift to both Sam Darnold and Zach Wilson because the Jets recently moved on from Sam Darnold, the former number three overall pick out of USC. I don't think Sam Darnold got a fair chance to succeed with the New York Jets, but also at the same time, he did not show enough special traits for me to believe that he can become a great franchise quarterback, a quarterback that I'm going to potentially pay 35 to 40 plus million dollars to one day. You know, Joe Burrow, Justin Herbert, Kyler Murray, I see the flashes. I'm already sold, okay? And I wasn't a huge fan of Sam Darnold even back at USC. I never felt that Sam Darnold was ever going to be a great NFL quarterback. I felt he could be good. I felt he could win games. But I didn't ever see him being a transcendent player or a super-duper impactful franchise quarterback that could go out there and win you multiple Super Bowls. And I think that you should be taking big swings in the NFL. And I'm not a huge fan of Zach Wilson either. I think Zach Wilson is very, very overhyped, okay? And I think Zach Wilson and Sam Darnold are very similar players. I think both at times play way too reckless. They, they tend to have a reckless playing style that they feed into. They have good arms, but not great arms. And the book out on Zach Wilson and Sam Darnold is they are horrible when pressure is in their face, and they at times have poor judgment, okay? And that's bad for a quarterback. You obviously need to be able to handle the blitz a little bit in the NFL, right? And to me, I felt the Jets should move on from Sam Darnold because, to me, there's an obvious upgrade over Sam Darnold in this draft class, a guy that's significantly better than him. That guy is Justin Fields, and potentially that guy is Trey Lance. And by the way, for you guys that are saying, oh, but Trey Lance, you don't want to throw him into the fire. Well, guess what? You can go sign a Joe Flacco. You can go sign a Tate Bridgewater. You can find a veteran quarterback to come in there and just, you know, pretty much, you know, take the beating for Trey Lance before he develops, you know. And Zach Wilson, to me, is not a huge upgrade over Sam Darnold. And the New York Jets, there are reports that they're going to draft Zach Wilson. And look, I wish Zach Wilson nothing but the best. But to me, that's the wrong draft pick. That's not who I would be taking, okay? I just don't see it, you know? And Zach Wilson's not a huge upgrade over Sam Darnold. I'm sorry, but that's just my opinion. And I will say Zach Wilson will be in a much stable situation than what Sam Darnold inherited. But... He still will have a lot to overcome as a player in New York. New York has a bad roster. They're in a division with three really good defensive-minded head coaches, Sean McDermott, Bill Belichick, and Brian Flores. And I'm not sure if Zach, if Zach Wilson's going to work out. That's why I believe that Zach Wilson is not a significant upgrade over Sam Darnold. If you were going to draft Zach Wilson, you should have kept Sam Darnold. And the obvious upgrade over Sam Darnold was Justin Fields. Point blank period.
period. No excuses, okay? So the harsh reality for Jets fans is, look, I, I, I hope that Zach Wilson pans out. I do believe he's going to be put in a much sta more stable situation than um, what Sam Darnold was put in. But I don't think you're significantly upgrading over Sam Darnold. I just don't. And by the way, if Sam Darnold dominates in Carolina, there's going to be a lot of people that will have to answer some questions because the minute Sam Darnold leaves your building and he starts to dominate, you're going to be asked a lot of questions, and that's going to be a bad look for that organization. So that's how I feel about Zach Wilson. I would not draft him if I'm the New York Jets. and. That's just my humble opinion, okay? It's not that Zach Wilson's not a good prospect. I just believe there are better options out there with the number two overall pick. Is Zach Wilson really, in hindsight, the second best player in this draft? I highly doubt it, and I think that he potentially could disappoint Jets fans if not developed properly. Okay, everyone, I'm going to take a short break. When I return, I will tell you the quarterback the New York Jets should be drafting. You guys probably know who it is, but you know if you don't, you're going to find out. Don't go anywhere, people. You are listening to The Juice Alert. My name is Jamon McKinney. I will be right back. Okay, I am back. I now want to transition to Justin Fields. I believe Justin Fields is a generational talent. I'm a big believer in what Justin Fields brings to the table. I don't, I don't understand the criticism of Justin Fields. I feel like there's a prospect every single year that gets picked on a little bit too unfairly. I think Justin Fields is that guy in the 2020 NFL draft class, at least among the quarterbacks, you know. And today, I'm going to tell you why Justin Fields should be the number two overall pick and why the New York Jets should be drafting Justin Fields and not Zach Wilson, okay? Obviously, Trevor Lawrence is going to go number one overall to the Jaguars. I have no problem with that. To me, Trevor Lawrence is a generational talent within him, within himself, very similar to Justin Fields, okay? I think you, I really, I really don't think you can go wrong with either one, you know? That's my opinion. And look, this segment, I'm going to endorse Justin Fields to you. I'm not going to bash Zach Wilson and tear him down, you know? It's, the, th the thing about Justin Fields is, and, and the thing about Justin Fields and why I believe he should be the New York Jets quarterback is he's just better than Zach Wilson. That's, it has nothing to do with Zach Wilson. It more so has to do with how special Justin Fields is. Like I said, Justin Fields is a generational talent. As when you look at his arm strength, his accuracy, his mobility, his 4.41 40-yard dash, the fact that he makes great decisions with the football, Outside of Trevor Lawrence, among quarterbacks in this draft class, who's more talented than Justin Fields? Maybe Trey Lance, but for my money, I think Justin Fields has a little bit more God-given ability than Trey Lance, okay? And the Jets recently moved on from Sam Darnold, so they need to find a quarterback that is far and away and obviously better than him. And listen, if Sam Darnold leaves the New York Jets and dominates in Carolina, the Jets organization is going to look bad. So you need to get a significant upgrade over Sam Darnold, okay? The quarterback you are drafting, he has to be better than what Sam Darnold is in Carolina, okay? Because the criticism will always be, oh, Carolina got the most out of Sam Darnold. How come the Jets dysfunctional, dysfunctional organization could not do it? And when it comes to Zach Wilson, he's not obviously a better prospect than Sam Darnold. When it comes to Mac Jones, He's not obviously a more talented prospect than Sam Darnold. And by the way, when it comes to me saying this, that's me saying a lot because I was not a huge Sam Darnold fan back at USC. But I'll take Sam Darnold over Mac Jones and over Zach Wilson. Maybe I could debate between Mac Jones because I do think Mac Jones is a little bit underrated. But just as far as talent, I believe Sam Darnold's more talented than Mac Jones. And to me, Justin Fields is an obvious much better prospect than Sam Darnold. He just is. When I watch the tape, he's a better decision maker. He has a better arm. He's a better athlete. And he's much more consistent. And he won much more big games than Sam Darnold when Sam Darnold was at USC. And Sam Darnold had a lot of good players around him at USC. We can talk about the coaching staff and make excuses all we want, but he went to a good program, and USC was very talented at the time he was there. And Justin Fields, to me, has that it factor. And I believe Justin Fields will shine bright 
under the Big Apple lights. He will shine bright as a star in New York. The pressure will not overwhelm Justin Fields. This is a guy that was on the same field in the college football playoffs as Trevor Lawrence. And in both games, you can make the argument that Justin Fields was better than Trevor Lawrence. Like a guy that people saying might a guy that people are saying might be the next John Elway or the next Peyton Manning. That's how much praise Trevor Lawrence is getting. And Justin Fields arguably outplayed him in both college football games. He was able to win one of those games obviously this past year, winning the other, winning this past game in dominant fashion, okay? Zach Wilson and Sam Darnold to me, you know, Sam Darnold obviously was a little bit overwhelmed by that New York media. I think Zach Wilson's going to be overwhelmed by this, by the media and the mecca that is New York. I just, I, I just don't believe it. I don't buy into it, you know? Now, are you truly going to pass on a generational talent in Justin Fields for a guy in Zach Wilson? Who has some skills, but here's the facts. He didn't play great, he didn't play against great competition in college. Justin Fields played 12 ranked opponents at Ohio State. He went 10 and 2 in those games, okay? He, he, He beat a lot of good teams and he faced a lot of great teams. Zach Wilson was 0 5 in his career at BYU versus teams that won 10 or more games. And do you know what Zach Wilson's statistics were Statistics were in those five games as a passer? He threw one touchdown pass to seven interceptions and barely completed 62% of his throws. I'm sorry, people, but if you want to draft Zach Wilson over a guy like Justin Fields, good luck to you because I'm not willing to take that risk. I'm just not. And, and for my money, Trey Lance is better then Zach Wilson, at least he's more t- at least he's more talented. And I'm sorry. I don't want to hear the excuse that, oh, he's not ready to play right away. Well, guess what? You can go find a veteran quarterback out there somewhere, like a Joe Flacco, like a Teddy Bridgewater, to come in and help develop this guy. You can do that. I guarantee you there's someone out there that Jets can find. Heck, go trade for Gardner Minshew. I guarantee you the Jaguars would love to get a couple of draft picks for Gardner Minshew. Gardner Minshew could come right into the Jets organization and win games and help develop Trey Lance. And for my money, I think Matt Jones is a little bit better than Zach Wilson. I just don't buy into this Zach Wilson guy. But getting back to Justin Fields, Justin Fields is a generational talent. He has that it factor. And I'm going to go out on a limb and say right now, the New York Jets would be absolutely foolish to pass on Justin Fields because he's right there for the taking, and he he's a quarterback that I would not pass on at all, no doubt about it. So recently, Alex Smith retired, the former number one overall pick in the 2005 NFL Draft, and to me, it was the right decision for Alex Smith. His best years are, are behind him. There wasn't a true market out there for Alex Smith once he got released by Washington. And what you have to know about Alex Smith was, obviously, he was the number one overall pick in the 2005 NFL Draft, and he was drafted over Aaron Rodgers, the Green Bay Packers star quarterback, a first ballot Hall of Famer. He was also drafted over over, um, Frank Gore, DeMarcus Ware, a couple of other notable Hall of Famers from that draft class. And, look, the bottom line is Aaron Rodgers has outshined Alex Smith you know, ever since he's entered the NFL. That doesn't, that doesn't mean Alex Smith has had a terrible career up to this point because he's had a pretty solid career. You know, he has something to be proud of. A 14-year career, 16 if you count the years in which he was injured, but I'm going to count the 14 years where he where he actually played 199 career touchdowns to, 100, to 109 interceptions, 35,000 passing yards, a three-time pro bowler, and in 2012, he took the 49ers to the NFC Championship game, one game away from the Super Bowl they were. And recently, this past year, he was the 2020 NFL Comeback Player of the Year. Okay? So, Alex Smith had a decent career. Now, the question was, well, I should say, I should say the question is, was Alex Smith a successful number one overall pick? The answer to that question is no, he was not. And that might be a little bit, a little bit harsh to you guys, but when you're picked number one overall in the draft, 
you're expected to be transcendent, or at least great, okay, or at least a top 10 quarterback. And Alex Smith was always a good, solid, decent starting quarterback. But he was never great, okay? And the truth is, he should have never been the number one overall pick. So, in reality, we can say Alex Smith was not a successful number one overall pick. But the, but the true reality was, it's unfair to judge him that way because he should have never been the number one overall pick. It, it clearly should have been Aaron Rodgers. No doubt about it within my mind, okay? And the truth is, if Alex Smith goes a few slots later and he has the career that he has, I'm probably not banging on the guy right now, okay? Now, the one thing we can say about Alex Smith is wherever he went, he won football games. He won in San Francisco, he won in Kansas City, and he won in Washington, okay? And I will say, Alex Smith should be commended for overcoming adversity throughout his career. In nine games as a rookie, Alex Smith had one touchdown pass to 11 interceptions. I guarantee you in today's NFL, if he puts on that performance, he's out the league, okay, the very next year. Well, maybe not out the league, but at least without a starting job, okay? The next year, 16 touchdown passes to 16 interceptions. The very next year, gets a shoulder injury out for the entire season. Even this year in Washington, unbelievable comeback story. He was he he potentially could have died from having that serious leg injury because of the you know um, poisonous stuff that potentially he could have caught you know. Um, but either way, Alex Smith deserves to be commended for getting his career back on track after a very slow rocky start. But the truth of, ma- of the matter is, Alex Smith was not a, was not a successful number one overall pick. And look, I think that both things can be true. Alex Smith. Was not a, was not a successful number one overall pick, but also he still had a very decent career and he should be committed for it. I believe both things can be true. Shout out to Alex Smith; he had a very solid career, and to me, he should be happy with what, with what he put together as far as his NFL career. Um, Alex Smith has retired, and I wish him the best in his years after football. So I talked about Alex Smith just now, and. The honest truth is, looking back at the 2005 NFL draft, Aaron Rodgers should have been the number one overall pick in that draft. I mean, he's just flat out better than Alex Smith, okay? Aaron Rodgers' first career is going to finish top five in touchdown passes, top five in passing yards, top five in pass rating. He's already a three-time NFL MVP award winner, and he might very well he might very well win one or two more MVP awards when it's all said and done. He's won a Super Bowl. He's got a Super Bowl MVP. And for my money, Aaron Rodgers is already a top five quarterback of all time. And if he's not already a top five quarterback of all time, when it's all said and done, I believe he'll be in that category without any questions asked. Aaron Rodgers is the most talented thrower the football the NFL has ever seen. No doubt about it. And... I know what you people out there are going to say. Well, Jamon, Aaron Rodgers sat for three years behind Brett Favre. That's why he's so great. And I will admit, Alex Smith was thrown into the fire very early as a rookie. The first three years, he had a bad roster, multiple different coordinators in San Francisco. And I will say, Alex Smith deserves a lot of credit for ultimately surviving that and salvaging his NFL career. And you have to give the San Francisco the San Francisco 49ers organization a ton of credit for being patient with Alex Smith. And here's what I'm going to say. Like I said, Aaron Rodgers, he should have been the first overall pick to the San Francisco 49ers back in the 2005 NFL draft. I will say this. Would Aaron Rodgers have developed into a guy that's won multiple MVPs, and ultimately developed into being the most talented thrower of the football the NFL has ever seen? Maybe, maybe not. I'm going to say probably not. Let's just say Aaron Rodgers isn't quite as great as he is right now if he lands in San Francisco. But I still think Aaron Rodgers would have had a chance to become an all-time great quarterback 
if he was drafted by the San Francisco 49ers. The raw talent that Aaron Rodgers has does not lie on tape, people, okay? And by the way, let's keep in mind, guys like John Elway, Peyton Manning, and Troy Aikman all had horrible starts to their career. They're Hall of Famers. And the 49ers, after a three- to four-year stretch of bad, dysfunctional football in Alex Smith's early career, they found Jim Harbaugh. And Jim Harbaugh provided great stability to that organization. And ever since the years of dysfunctional, you know, mess with Alex Smith, the 49ers have gotten to Super Bowls with Colin Kaepernick and Jimmy Garoppolo. You mean to tell me they couldn't have gotten to at least one Super Bowl with Aaron Rodgers? My guess is Aaron Rodgers, as an individual talent, his numbers would probably not be as all-time great if he landed in San Francisco. Because in Green Bay, he got to learn from a Hall of Fame quarterback, and he really got to hone his skills. Okay, so numbers-wise and flashiness-wise, we may have not seen the seen Aaron Rodgers being the bad man that he is. He may not be... Getting, he may not have been. The, he may have never been in the conversation for most talented thrower of the football ever. But I still think Aaron Rodgers could have been, could have become an all time great quarterback in San Francisco, an organization that's aggressive, that signs for agents, that prior that prioritizes defense and winning the line of scrimmage. Something Green Bay has neglected for years, and they got into Super Bowls with Jimmy Garoppolo and Colin Kaepernick. My guess is they would have won at least one Super Bowl with Aaron Rodgers if he was a 49er by now. And to be quite honest with you, I'm going to go out on a limb and say Aaron Rodgers wins multiple Super Bowls with the San Francisco 49ers if he was drafted by that team. Because I think San Francisco understands what it takes as an organization to be a Super Bowl caliber team more so than the Green Bay Packers. Now, the Green Bay Packers ultimately won this race with the 49ers, just because the 49ers, it's been a long time since they won a Super Bowl. It's been over 20 years. The Packers won a Super Bowl back in 2011 with Aaron Rodgers. So ever since Aaron Rodgers was drafted, the 49ers have zero Super Bowls. The Packers have won one Super Bowl. Okay, so that's great. And they've won more games than the 49ers over that stretch. But I still think that Aaron Rodgers, like I said, he could have become an all-time great quarterback in San Francisco if he landed there. I believe they would have landed with the right. I believe they would have found the right head coach for him. They would have supported him. And Aaron Rodgers would have still been a great quarterback. That's how I feel about Aaron Rodgers. And looking back on history, he should have been the first overall pick in that draft, no doubt about it. I want to now talk about the Atlanta Falcons. I believe the Atlanta Falcons should draft a quarterback in the 2021 NFL draft. To me, and look, I've been saying this for years now. The Atlanta Falcons have reached their ceiling with Matt Ryan. Matt Ryan, several years ago, got them to a Super Bowl. He was a league MVP. But ultimately, Matt Ryan and the Falcons, they blew a 28-3 lead. And ever since that moment, Matt Ryan and the Atlanta Falcons have underachieved. And they haven't sniffed the Super Bowl. They haven't even come close. And I think the Falcons need to stop justifying the fact that Matt Ryan has just flat out underachieved in the past four to five seasons, okay? And now Matt Ryan is 35 years old. And to me, as a traditional pocket passer that is declining a little bit, he doesn't fit today's NFL. I would choose Justin Fields or Trey Lance's upside over what Matt Ryan has left. I believe there are three quarterbacks that, that... Let me just put it to you this way. Let me rephrase that because I'm getting off track a little bit. There are three quarterbacks in this draft that I really, truly believe if you put a great team around them and you develop them properly, they can become great. That's Trevor Lawrence, Justin Fields, and Trey Lance. I guarantee you one of those quarterbacks will be there with the number four overall pick for the Atlanta Falcons. If the Falcons don't see one of those guys there, then I'm okay with the Falcons maybe drafting a Patrick Sertain or a Kyle Pitt. You know what I'm saying? But I believe they should choose a young rookie quarterback in this draft class over what Matt Ryan has left. 
And there's a trend in the NFL, at least over the past decade. Teams with quarterbacks on a rookie contract, they tend to win Super Bowls. It's just the facts, people. Kansas City won a Super Bowl on Patrick Mahomes' rookie contract. The Seattle Seahawks won a Super Bowl on Russell Wilson's rookie contract. The Green Bay Packers won a Super Bowl on Aaron Rodgers' rookie contract. The Philadelphia Eagles won a Super Bowl on Carson Wentz's rookie contract. And the New England Patriots, because Tom Brady took pay cuts, they were able to win multiple Super Bowls. Okay? And obviously because of other factors, but Tom Brady taking pay cuts was a big factor in that. Folks, Matt Ryan's expensive. It doesn't fit today's NFL. And quite frankly, he's underachieved these, these past couple of years. And there are more and more great quarterbacks entering the NFL. You need to move on. It is time for the Falcons to move on for Matt Ryan. You've got the number four overall pick. You have a chance to get a star quarterback or a rookie contract. And you must think big pitcher. You're not going to win a Super Bowl with Matt Ryan. It's the harsh reality. I'm sorry. It's not going to happen. Stop trying to rebuild with Matt Ryan. Get a star quarterback in that building. You will be rewarded. And I guarantee you, years from now, we're going to say, man, if the Falcons pass on one of these one of these marquee guys, we're going to say, man, the Falcons, they, they could have Justin Fields. They could have Trey Lance sitting behind Matt Ryan for a year or two and developing. Man, they missed out. Atlanta, swallow your pride. Figure out the cap situation later with Matt Ryan and get it rolling with the rookie quarterback like Justin Fields or Trey Lance, someone of that caliber. The Atlanta Falcons should draft a quarterback in the 2001 NFL Draft. I now want to talk about the Patriots. The question is, should the New England Patriots draft a quarterback? Now, there are reports coming out of New England that they're high on Mac Jones. They're also high on Justin Fields. Maybe they could look to draft Trey Lance. Trey Lance hasn't been linked to the Patriots as much as a guy like Justin Fields or Mac Jones. But I could see a situation where Trey Lance potentially falls in the draft. And if he's there for the taking, maybe New England drafts him, okay? And look, in the past, I've said the Patriots roster needs a lot of work. Based on what I saw this past year in 2020, when the Patriots missed the playoffs, I said the roster wasn't very good. This roster has a ton of holes. And I said they should not be thinking about the quarterback position. They should focus on building a great roster around Cam Newton. And I believe if you build a great roster around Cam Newton, he can still win you a Super Bowl. I've said that in the past. I truly have. And I do think the Patriots bringing back Cam Newton was the right move. Okay, I think Cam Newton didn't get a fair shake in New England last year based on the COVID protocols and based on, you know, limited offseason. You know, he had you know, to deal with not a great roster, learning a whole new playbook, new team, new players, new coaching staff. It was a mess for Cam Newton, and he had a lot lot to overcome. So I understand why the Patriots brought him back. And look, if you go for it with Cam Newton and build a great roster around him, he'll win you a lot of football games. I guarantee you. I believe in what Cam Newton brings to the table, even though I believe he's well past his prime. But the more and more I think about it, I think the Patriots, should seriously consider drafting a quarterback in the 2021 NFL Draft. Because while I do still like what Cam Newton brings to the table, he's not quite the same. He's not quite what he used to be. You know, there's been some injuries over the past couple of years. He still has accuracy issues. And he's not as dynamic as he once was back in 2015 when he won the league MVP. And in a division with Josh Allen, the Miami Dolphins defense, potentially a star quarterback in Zach Wilson or Justin Fields. I need a star quarterback on a rookie contract if I can get that guy. And the truth is, the Patriots have an environment to develop a young quarterback. They spent some money in free agency, so the roster is better than it was a year ago. Cam Newton's a veteran quarterback that's played a lot of football that would have no problem mentoring a young guy, in my opinion. And Bill Belichick and that coaching staff They can get the most out of a quarterback, okay, if they have talent. So, again, I go back to my philosophy. Why not be great instead of good? 
I think the Patriots can be really good with Cam Newton as their quarterback. But if they can develop someone like Trey Lance or Justin Fields, maybe they bring in Mac Jones. I don't know. They have a t- they have the potential to be great. And like I said, you get that quarterback on a rookie contract. That gives you the opportunity to spend a ton of money in free agency. Gives you cap flexibility. So, will the Patriots grab the quarterback? I'm not sure. You know, should they do it? I think if I think if you have a guy like Fields or Trey Lance in striking distance and you could trade up for him, you should do it. I believe if Mac Jones is there, you should seriously consider taking him, you know? So that's how I feel about the Patriots. I'm really interested to see what Bill Belichick and the Patriots do in the upcoming draft. Will they will they draft the quarterback or will they pass? Maybe, maybe not. We all shall see. I can't wait to find out. Let's talk about another team that potentially could draft a quarterback in the 2021 NFL Draft, that team being the Detroit Lions. Should the Detroit Lions draft a quarterback in the 2021 NFL Draft? I believe the answer to this question should be no. Now, here's the thing. If a guy like Justin Fields or Trey Lance or a starter quarterback that you believe in falls to you at the number seven overall spot, I can understand why the Lions would say to themselves, okay, we have this talented quarterback that's fallen to us. We just can't pass up on him. Let's get him aboard. Let's get him aboard our roster and develop him and see what happens. I have no problem with that. Okay, and look, the Detroit Lions have Jared Goff on their roster. And Jared Goff can sort of be the guy to take the beating in in spite of the young quarterback where, you know, you don't want to throw Justin Fields or someone like that into the fire. You have Jared Goff there. He can be the stopgap quarterback for a year. And, you know, you see what happens. You don't care about how many games you win. You just put the guy out there while Justin Fields or whoever you have on the roster develops, okay? Um... And that quarterback can sit, for, sit behind Jared Goff for a year. I think Jared Goff would actually be a decent mentor. But here's the thing. If you're the Detroit Lions, you have to ask yourself this question. Do I have the environment to get the most out of a young quarterback? I believe the answer to this question is no. And I'd argue no quarterback is set up to succeed long term with the current with the current construction of this Detroit Lions roster. That doesn't mean this roster can't get better. That doesn't mean five years from now the Lions might be contend might be a playoff contender. You know, but right now you don't have the infrastructure to allow a quarterback to be successful at the highest of order. Okay? You just don't, okay? This roster is not very good. Looking at this team, you got a bad wide receiver core, not a great offensive line, a bad defense, and a rookie head coach in Dan Campbell, who we are all pulling for and who we are who we are all rooting for. But do we really know what Dan Campbell is going to bring to the table? I don't think we do. I think he's a big-time question mark. So I would strongly advise the Detroit Lions to beef up their roster before drafting a quarterback, because outside of maybe someone like Aaron Rodgers, Patrick Mahomes, you know, Russell Wilson, if those quarterbacks were on your roster, maybe you could win football games. But outside of those guys, maybe Deshaun Watson, you know, you're not going to win a lot of games with most starting quarterbacks currently in the NFL. You know, even Tom Brady. Tom Brady, at this point in his career, he needs a good offensive line and great weapons around to around him to succeed. That's a big reason why he left the New England Patriots, because, well, he said, I don't have good enough weapons. I can't win here. We even saw Patrick Mahomes in the Super Bowl. When his offensive line wasn't blocking and his wide receivers were not getting open, he didn't do jack, you know what. He didn't do Okay? So, my thing is, if you're the Detroit Lions, maybe beef up this roster before you start thinking about the quarterback position, okay? And who knows? Maybe Jared Goff is your guy. Maybe he is. Maybe he's your guy. So, you know, I would strongly advise the Lions to try to beef up their roster to then see what they have in Jared Goff, and then next year, determine if we need a quarterback or not, okay? That's how I feel about the Detroit Lions. And if I'm the Lions and their organization, 
and I'm a part of that organization, I should say, I wouldn't be drafting a quarterback. At least I would seriously consider passing on drafting a quarterback, at least in the 2021 NFL draft. I now want to shift to the Philadelphia Eagles, another team that could potentially be in the quarterback market in the 2021 NFL draft. Should the Philadelphia Eagles draft a quarterback? That's the, that's the last final team I'm going to talk about right here. Should the Eagles draft a quarterback in the 2021 NFL draft? First of all, let me say this. At number 12 overall, I doubt you're going to get anyone like Trey Lance, you know, Zach Wilson, Justin Fields. Most of the star quarterbacks are going to be gone by the time Philadelphia has that number 12 overall pick. But to answer the question, should Philadelphia draft a quarterback, I say no. You want to know why? The reason why I say no is for a couple of reasons. First of all, you have Jalen Hurts on the roster. Why not see what Jalen Hurts has as a starting quarterback? Jalen Hurts won a lot of games at Alabama and Oklahoma. He showed drastic improvement as a prospect year to year. Last year as a rookie, he outperformed Carson Wentz despite not having a lot of talent around him, despite having no OTAs, you know, not a whole lot of first-team reps. Jalen Hurts, from rookie standards, and based on what was around him last year, he played some good, well-above-average football as a starting quarterback, okay? Why not give him the full 16 games to see what he has? Maybe he's a franchise quarterback. So that's one thing. And in reality, very similar to the Detroit Lions, the Philadelphia Eagles have a bottom five roster. They just need good play. They need better players. This roster is not a complete roster. Philadelphia, how about you fix your wide receiver core, your tight end core, your offensive line, maybe get an extra defensive back or two on your defense before you start thinking about the quarterback. Because, see, what bad organizations do is this. They think that with one quick fix, everything is solved. Like, oh, We'll, we'll draft this quarterback. Our problems are solved, you know. They think that that's the duct tape that they need. And I'm here to tell you right now, that's not the right way to go about building your football team. You need to be thinking about your overall roster, not just the quarterback position. And you need to think about if your environment is conducive to success for a young quarterback. And I'm going to say right now, Philadelphia doesn't have a good enough roster to compete in the NFC, not even close. In their division, I'll take Dallas, I'll take Washington, I'll take the Giants over Philadelphia in a heartbeat, not even close. They're the worst team in the worst division in all football right now. They have a, they have questions ahead head coach. So I would bring Jalen Hurts along for the ride. In this upcoming draft, I would, so I would try to put good players around Jalen Hurts to see what I have and then – We'll decide what happens from that point going forward. But right now, I don't think the Philadelphia Eagles should draft a quarterback in the 2021 NFL Draft. I now want to shift to Kyle Pitts. So Kyle Pitts is a tight end slash wide receiver prospect out of the University of Florida. He had a great year this past year. He dominated college football. He is six foot six. 240 pounds. He runs the 40-yard dash in 4.4 seconds. He has a crazy vertical jump, great hands. He's everything you look for in a tight end prospect. And Mel Kuyper Jr. recently came out and said that he believes Kyle Pitts might arguably be the best tight end prospect that he's ever evaluated. And Mel Kuyper Jr. has evaluated a lot of good prospects, okay? so. Kyle Pitts is getting all this buzz and all this hype. Today, I want to answer the question, is Kyle Pitts the next elite tight end in the National Football League? And look, the potential is definitely there. You know, but I will say this. The greatest tight ends of all time aren't usually the most hyped up guys. And usually, they're not the first ones off the board Come draft night, Shannon Sharp, one of the greatest tight ends of all time, he was a seventh-round pick. Rob Gronkowski, he was a second-round pick. Travis Kelsey and George Kittle, the two best tight ends in all football right now, 
They were not first-round picks. Mark Andrews, he's one of the five best tight ends in all of football. He was not a first-round pick. And the last super du- – let, let me just give you a couple of tight ends over the past couple of years that have gotten similar hype to Kyle Pitts. These guys weren't quite as hyped up as Kyle Pitts, but they were pretty hyped up, I would say. They, people were saying, oh, these tight ends are the next generational talent. The next Rob Gronkowski. They're going to change NFL teams. They're going to change NFL offenses. O.J. Howard was talked about in that breath out of Alabama several years ago. O.J. Howard is about the third best tight end on the Tampa Bay Buccaneers roster right now. He's been a disappointment, okay? T.J. Hawkinson, he's good, but he was getting compared to Rob Gronkowski coming out of Iowa. I think he's a good player. That has a chance to be a Pro Bowl player for a long time, but hasn't quite lived up to the hype. Remember Vernon Davis coming out of college? Everyone said Vernon Davis is, is this next great athlete, this transcendent player. Vernon Davis was a good player and even a great player for about a season or two, but he never lived up to the hype. And look, I love what Kyle Pitts brings to the table. And I just wanted to point out those other prospects just because history is not on Kyle Pitts' side. History suggests that even though Kyle Pitts is six foot six, 240 pounds, runs the 40-yard dash in 4.4 seconds, history suggests that Kyle Pitts is not going to be as great as we think he can become. Obviously, there's the Mike Dickens of the world, a guy that was drafted in the top five, and he became a Hall of Famer. Maybe Kyle Pitts is that guy. I'm in, I'm interested to see how it plays out. I will say, I would I would be comfortable taking Kyle Pitts with a top five pick. I would because I I love the elite traits. I do think he's a little bit slower on the actual football field than what as opposed to what he tests as far as you know with the combine drills. You know, he runs he runs a four point four forty yard dash. I don't always see 4.4 speed on tape. He's definitely very fast, but not quite that fast. I think he's a little bit slower than people are are willing to give him credit for. Okay, and I'll say this. In order for Kyle Pitts to maximize his skills, I think he needs to go to a team that will be able to get the most out of him. What if Kyle Pitts goes to Miami and Tua Tungabaloa isn't good enough? What if he goes to Carolina? And Sam Darnold isn't good enough. What if he goes to Atlanta and flops? I mean, I think I think it's going to work in Atlanta. Recently, in my most in my recent in my most recent mock draft, I had Kyle Pitts going to the Falcons with the number four overall pick. I think it's going to work, but I thought Odell Beckham Jr. was going to work in Cleveland. It didn't work out. Maybe Matt Ryan doesn't have great chemistry with Kyle Pitts. Does that speak to the actual organization and the quarterback? Or does that speak to Kyle Pitts as a player? All I'm saying is there's so many factors that factor into if a player is great or not. You need to be in a great system. You need to be in a good situation. And as a pass catcher, you need a great quarterback around you. So I really want to see Kyle Pitts go to a team that's going to use him in very creative ways and allow him to be himself. And I will say I'm betting betting on Kyle Pitts potentially being a Pro Bowl-level player potentially one day. Okay, I think he's going to make a couple of Pro Bowls. I don't know if he'll ever be the transcendent player we think he's going to be, but it won't shock me just because, like I said, the elite traits are there. However, I will say, if Kyle Pitts, for whatever reason, fails to meet expectations in the NFL, it might be because he's not the greatest separator. He doesn't create separation at an elite level. He's good at it. But he's not great at it. You know, he, he more times than not gets away with his athletic ability and his God-given talent. Not always the most technically sound guy when you watch him, but there's a lot to like. And I would definitely pick him in the top five because I think the traits are definitely there. And I'm willing to take a big swing and see what happens. Maybe I hit a home run. Maybe I hit a double. Either way, I think it's floor. Is significantly high. I believe you're going to get a good player regardless of what happens. You know, will he ever be great? Will he ever be transcendent? We'll see what happens. 
I'm excited to find out. I want to end the show by talking about Kellen Mond. Recently, I ranked my top five quarterbacks in the 2021 NFL Draft class. That list included Trey Lance, Zach Wilson, Trevor Lawrence. But I did not include Texas A&M starting quarterback Kellen Mond in my top five. But I did put him in my wild card category. Every single year when I evaluate the top five quarterbacks, I kind of go over, I, I, I look at these quarterbacks, I sort them out, and I pick one guy that not everyone is, is talking about, enough in my opinion, that I think potentially could surprise someone, a.k.a. Dak Prescott style and a.k.a. Tom Brady style. Dak Prescott, if you don't know, he's a he's, he's the starting quarterback for the Dallas Cowboys, but he was not talked about a, a lot in college as a prospect. In fact, he was a fourth round pick. A lot of people, a lot of people wrote him off. Tom Brady was a sixth round pick in college. He develops into being the greatest quarterback of all time. And I do believe that Kellen Mond, at least in my opinion, has a chance to be the Dak Prescott, the Russell Wilson, or the Tom Brady of this draft class. Okay. And the reason why I say that is because there are some legitimate things to like about Kellen Mond. He does have a legitimate NFL arm. He has a really, really strong arm. He consistently showed that he can fit the ball into tight windows. He's not afraid to take risks down the field. At times, I think he actually takes way too many risks. I like to pull him back a little bit. But it's a lot easier to teach a home run hitter how to hit singles and doubles rather than teaching a singles and doubles hitter how to hit home runs, you know what I'm saying? So he has a talent, and he makes, and on tape, you see some incredible off-platform, off-balance throws that very few quarterbacks in the NFL can even make, okay? And I can make the argument, Kellen Mond has the most electric arm in this draft class. He's also very athletic, where he can run around, extend plays, and you can run some RPOs with him. The problem with Kellen Mond, however, and why I believe he's going to be synced as a prospect, and why he probably is not going to be a first-round pick is because he's very stiff. And when you're a quarterback, you don't want to be uptight and stiff with your mechanics. You want to be nice and fluid, and, and you want to make it look look natural, you know. And look, Phillip Rivers didn't have the most natural throwing style. He seemed to make it work. But when I watch Aaron Rodgers, Tom Brady, Patrick Mahomes, and Kyler Murray. I mean, the football just comes out of their hand effortlessly. Even some guys like Kirk Cousins, you see those repeatable, you see the repeatable mechanics, and the ball just, you know, comes out their hand really easily. Kell Mon, he's really uptight. He just doesn't seem loose enough. And when you're tight and not loose enough, it, it leads to inaccuracy issues. He has bad mechanics at times. He's really hot and cold with his accuracy. And look, if I were to grade Kellen Mond in terms of arm strength, his ability to process, his decision-making, his athletic ability, and his accuracy, I would put accuracy as his worst graded category. And that's a problem because in the NFL, that's the one thing you need to be is an accurate quarterback. There are very few exceptions in the NFL as far as quarterbacks that are inaccurate that have success, okay? There's very few exceptions. And a lot of those guys had great rosters around them, okay? And that's not guaranteed. So the point I'm trying to make is, look, I would take a risk on Kellen Mond if I believe in his talent and I believe in my coaching staff to develop a quarterback because there could be something there. Kellen Mond, to me at least, has the potential, if developed properly, to be a solid and effective franchise quarterback. I would love to see Kellen Mond potentially go to a team like maybe the New England Patriots, maybe the maybe the Minnesota Vikings, the New Orleans Saints, Washington, you know, Houston potentially, maybe he takes a flyer on them, you know, Chicago, teams that need quarterbacks, teams that could be looking for quarterbacks in the future where he can sit and learn and develop properly potentially, okay? So, look, I don't have a first-round grade on Kellen Mond, and honestly, I think Kellen Mond is going to slip to somewhere around the third to fifth round. He's going to get drafted probably around the third, fourth, or fifth round. I don't see Kellen Mond being a first-round pick, and I don't have a first-round grade on him. However, like I said, as a prospect, just because you are not, you don't have a first-round grade getting into the NFL, that doesn't mean you can't get better and better as a player. Tom Brady's not the same quarterback that he was back at uh, Michigan, okay, that he is today. 
You know, Russell Wilson, not the same quarterback that he was at Wisconsin that he is today, you know. So I think Kellen Mond is worth taking a risk on. He does have major bust potential. However, I would take a flyer on Kellen Mond and say, you know what? Whatever happens, happens. That is why I believe this one team should take a risk on Kellen Mond. That team is the Tampa Bay Buccaneers. And here's why. I believe the Buccaneers should draft Kellen Mond. I believe it makes sense, and I'll tell you why. First of all, the Buccaneers just won the Super Bowl recently, okay? And they pretty much returned all their starters. They are the most complete team in all of football and the most complete team I've ever seen since I've been watching football, okay? I haven't been watching football for 50 or 60 years like some of these old heads out there. But I've been watching it for almost about a good decade, okay? And they're the most complete team I've ever seen, okay? So why why is that relevant? That's relevant because the Buccaneers, they're so talented that they're pretty much drafting for depth. They're not, they don't have a single need or a single hole on their roster. They're drafting to just fill out the overall depth of their roster, and they're drafting for backups. So if you're pretty much just drafting for backups, why not take a flyer on a guy like Kellamon for the future? Listen, Tom Brady is going to be 44 years old this upcoming football season. And history suggests Tom Brady, whether we want to admit it or not, his clock is ticking as far as his football mortality, okay? He's not going to be this high-level quarterback at age 50 years old. Eventually, you are going to have to prepare for the future. It's only a matter of time before Tom Brady potentially falls off. He might fall off this year. It might be two years from now. It might be three years from now. It might be a year from now. Either way, I think the Buccaneers should really consider drafting a quarterback that they can sit behind Tom Brady and develop, and when Tom Brady is ready to ready to leave, they'll have a quarterback ready to go. And I do believe Kellen Mond could really benefit from sitting behind Tom Brady and, and learning how to become a more accurate passer, learning how to dissect defenses at a higher level, you know, and things like that. I think that if Kellen Mond reaches his full potential, he's the ideal Bruce Arians quarterback, and he has the arm talent to become a very effective NFL starter. So if I'm the defending Super Bowl champion, Tampa Bay Buccaneers, I'm going to at least think about the future just a tad bit, and I'm going to take a flyer on this guy like Kellen Mond. And listen, maybe that that motivates Tom Brady even more. Tom Brady, for the love of God, he, he, has, he has no other reason on earth, in my opinion, to be motivated to go out there and try to win Super Bowls. But maybe this is the extra chip that Tom Brady needs to go out there and prove his doubters wrong once again. But we'll see. The bottom line is, I think it'd be a great pick. It'd be a smart pick. And listen, if if Kellamon fails, then hey, you took a swing at a guy. You know, it is what it is. You know, Kellamon is not going to be a first round pick more than likely. He's probably going to be picked in the second, third, fourth, probably even fifth round. He's closer to a fourth or fifth round pick, probably. But we'll see. I do think Tampa Bay could be a team that looks to target Kellamon. And that is the ideal situation for Kellamon as far as if he were to become a, a future franchise quarterback. He can sit for a year or two and learn from Tom Brady and become the type of quarterback that Bruce Arians truly loves because he definitely has special arm talent. That's one thing we cannot deny in regards to Kellen Mond. We'll see what happens on draft night. Well, people, that's pretty much all I have today. Thank you so much for tuning into this episode. Have a God-blessed day. Stay safe out there. And I'm Ghost. Thank you so much for watching this video today. Please also note that the Juice Alert Sports Podcast is not just a YouTube channel. It is available on all podcasting platforms, including Spotify, Google Podcasts, iTunes, and Apple Podcasts. Also, if you enjoyed this video, be sure to like, comment, subscribe, and share this content with all your friends. This podcast is my favorite thing in the entire world right now. It is my passion. And I want more people to listen to this podcast. I really want this podcast to grow. Also, a fun fact about me is that I want to go into the sports broadcasting and media world once I graduate from the University of Toledo, a college in Northern Ohio. I am looking to become one of the next great sports broadcasters and analysts out in the world. 
and I potentially would like to start my own network if this podcast really truly grows or if I fall short of that goal. I would love to work for a big time network like ESPN or Fox Sports 1. I am open to all networks. So if you believe in my dreams and you see or hear my passion through the screen, be sure to tell all your friends about the Juice Alert Sports Podcast. Stay motivated, you guys. Have a God-blessed day, and I'm out.